Imagine the 2014 Ebola outbreak spreading its roots across Africa, killing thousands of people every single day. The whole of the scientific community is thrown into a state of tantrum because they seek better diagnosis and treatment methods. However, there is no absolute test for the Ebola virus, and the only possible candidate at that time was the San Vigiliza, a method that is very costly and not affordable by most common people. It required refrigeration, took a very long time to give its test results, and was not very reliable either. The whole world is concerned. And so is the 16-year-old teenager, Olivia Halisei. She developed the low-cost Ebola assay card that did not require refrigeration, gave its results in under 30 minutes, and was also very reliable. I think that she could do this just because she was not trained to think conventionally. And she took the risk because she was a teenager. Hello, I'm Amnesha Das, and I'm 15 years old. I try and come up with solutions to real life problems. And I belong to the minority community of child innovators in India. Allow me to take you back a few years and tell you a story. In 2014, when I was in my sixth grade, I fit into most Indian parents' ideal child image. I prepared for my tests much ahead of time. I scored quite well in them. I learned how to dance. I took Hindustani classical music lessons. I was also a black belt of Taekwondo. I was very satisfied, and my teachers were satisfied. And you know what they told me? They told me to keep up with this good work and continue on like this. But what I never realized then, and what they never understood, was that in the process, they trapped me in that conventional loop of school and textbooks. I grew to care so much about my marks. In fact, I fought for every single half mark that I lost in my test. I flowed away in the race of competitive examinations like every other Indian child does. But then in my seventh grade, something happened that quite changed things for me. I was down with this viral fever, and it was nothing very serious, but I had to stay back at home for the next few days. It was then that just to entertain me, my mom opened the homepage of Google Science Fair and told me to have a look at the projects. I stared at the screen and I reread the titles again and again. I could not make much sense out of it, nor could I get much of what they did. And what struck me was that these projects were done by people probably just a year or two older than me. I sensed a passion in them and in their projects that I failed to see in myself. This led to question that led me to question my own abilities. But then at the same time, I thought, if they could do it, then probably I could do it too. And that was my first part. So I went up to my parents and I told them, hey mommy, hey daddy, I want to be working on a project and I want to go to the lab too. At first they thought that probably I'd said those words out of my childish imaginations and they did not take me seriously. But I pressed on. And I think that they soon realized that I meant it. And when they did, of course, I received all the support without which I would never have been here today in the first place. From then on, every single afternoon, I used to sit with my mom in front of my laptop. And initially, I started off by looking at other projects. But then the underlying aim was to find a problem that I could solve. But months passed and things did not work out the way I wanted them to, I could not get the right problem. What I realized at this point of time was that all these problems need to be inspired from our daily life. So I stopped and I questioned myself. What is it that I could make better? Now you must know that at that point of time, I was only 12 years old. And the biggest problem in my life was to polish my shoes every single day in the morning before going to school. I thought it to be completely unnecessary and overrated. I thought, could I do something so that I don't have to polish my shoes every day? And then began my first research project. 
Throughout my project, I assumed that the main source of dust was the soil. So I started off by reading more about the components and the electrochemical properties of soil. And I found that soil has a tendency to become negatively charged. Simple science came in, like charges repel. I finalized in a mixture of Teflon and silicone, and I polished my shoes with that mixture. And it worked. The proof is that I haven't polished my shoes in the past three years. But my mom made me polish them today, you know. I, I guess that's OK. It's TEDx. What I realized then was that all these science fairs, these science competitions, they wanted solutions to problems that could change the world. How could my auto dust ripple and shoe polish have any impact on the global community whatsoever? But I wondered if it would be possible for me to use the same concept elsewhere to solve a problem with a greater impact. Now, around the time we were getting these solar panels installed at our house, and I noticed as the cleaning men came in every single week to wash the surface of these panels. I was curious, so I questioned them. I asked them questions like, how much did they charge, and why did they do it, and how did they do that? What I found was that they, tar what's that they charged raised 1250 for their weekly wash, which is a lot. And the problem they faced was that due to the accumulation of dust particles on the surface of solar panels, the efficiency of these panels could be reduced up to 50% in just 30 days. And this is a real problem. You can guess what happened next. I redesigned all my experiments. And I read it all of them. I found that my method could reduce the dust accumulation levels by 2.1 times. I soon after entered the state fair, and I was declared the second prize winner. I also won a patent filing grant. Now, by the time, I was already in my ninth grade. And that summer, I started looking for internships that I could apply to. After spending a considerable amount of time writing dozens of emails and being rejected over and over again, I finally made it into a biology lab. And I was so excited. But after a long wait, when I finally got to go to the lab, this is what happened. For the next month, I got to observe people, learn how to use a microscope, did egg breaking, and pivoting. I also encountered questions from the graduate students that went on something like this. Oh my god, you were just 14 and you're already hanging out in the lab? What do you plan to do with your life? Or something like, you probably already know about differential equations and read about reaction equilibrium, huh? And my favorite one, so what are you doing nowadays? I mean, seriously, they either underestimated me or treated me like a prodigy. And I was neither. The adults failed to get me. Now, the same summer, I had this so fascinating idea on a better method for internet addiction diagnosis. The problem, as I thought, was the existing solutions were that they kind of end up asking an addict, are you an addict? Which doesn't make much of sense, right? So I had a different thought in mind. And I realized that to test out my hypothesis, I would have to conduct a survey. Being a school kid, my most obvious options were my classmates. I approached them. Most of them refused straight away. The others answered that they were very reluctant. The problem is that people fail to realize scientific innovation has got no age bar. You don't have to be a 35-year-old, really nerdy guy, complete with a pair of lab glasses and a lab coat to be inventing. And this was something of the image that all of them had in their minds. I continued on with my project for the next few weeks, but eventually I had to abandon it. Yet. Another five, six months passed. And yet, another incident happened in my life. I got this amazing chance to go to Stanford University for a summer program. And things were so different there. I met people who had been in situations very similar to mine. I decided to share my idea with them. And I received much of critical feedback. But in the end, what I realized was that no one said that the idea that I proposed was not possible. So I set to work on it. And yet again, after a few months, I finally completed my project. It was only because of this project that I got the chance to be a part of the Indian team 
at the International Exhibition for Young Inventors 2018. My work was quite appreciated. I ended up winning the bronze medal at that event. And the most interesting part, I submitted my research paper to a scientific journal only the day before yesterday. Thank you. All these incidents reshaped me and those around me. I had probably redefined how I and the others think of me. But then I am just one out of 18 million high schoolers in Uttar Pradesh. And I'm just one out of 93 million high schoolers in the whole of India. What happens to the others? No, every child has got the potential to innovate and to change a bit of their own world. Then why is it so that India has got so few child innovators? This question led me to trace down the steps of innovations and figure out where exactly things went wrong. So the first step to innovate is to have an idea. Now, children from all around the world, be they be from India, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Germany, or probably Austria, have got equal access to problem generations. If the problem is just about generating problems, there are plenty of them out there to be solved through innovations. So that is not our main concern here. Sorting out that part and moving on to the next part of innovation is that when you have an idea or when you have a solution to a problem, how do you share it with the world? Being a teenager, I think there are three problem steps. The first is that you communicate your work with a scientific journal. The second is that you go up and present your work at the science fair. And the third is that you file a patent if applicable. Now, about the first channel, that is of communicating your work with a scientific journal. Being a teenager, what I realized was that it's very hard to write down your work in the form of a research paper if you don't have much of prior background to it. Plus, most journals would hesitate to publish a high schooler's work. So what is the solution? Well, there are some journals that publish exclusively for high schoolers, but again, a very few of them. Now, coming down to science fairs. Well, personally, I think that this is the best channel because, number one, you get to meet a lot of amazing people. They can either be a judges, they can be observers, or just fellow participants. The second point is that you get a lot of live feedback from people with diverse cultures and different degrees and different backgrounds. And the third is that you get to compete against people who are of your own age group. Now, coming specifically to science fairs in India, let me summarize the thing for you. There are a very, very few of them. I could almost, I repeat, almost count them on my fingers. <laughs> Just to show the gravity of the situation here today, I did a comparative study. I compared California, just the state, and India, the whole country. And I took up the case of Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which is the world's biggest pre-college science fair. And almost every child innovator or child scientist dream is to go up to that level and to present their work at the finals. Now, undoubtedly, it is very competitive. And even more unsurprisingly, it is super competitive in India. Seven million people participate every single year. Now, California, just the state, has got 14 state fairs leading up to ISAB. What that means is that if you qualify in any one of these, you get the chance to be part of their state team and be a part of the ISAB finals. In short, the major cities like San Francisco, San Jose, or Santa Cruz have got their own science fairs leading up to ISF. Now, all the three cities that I mentioned before, together, have got a population of 18.4 lakhs. Vegas Kanpur, the city where I live, itself has got a population of 29.2 lakhs. Now, hypothetically speaking, Kanpur too should have its own science fair leading up to ISF, which is crazy. As much as I know, in all these years, we had never even had a casual, friendly science fair. The truth is that there is only one science fair leading up to ISAF from India. So the main problem that I think with our society is the lack of opportunities. About the third channel that is for patents, I tried finding data pertaining to the age of those who file a patent, but unfortunately, I could not get any data for India and for any of the other countries that I tried to survey. So let me summarize the things for you. What I mean to say 
is that children are amazing. Studies suggest that children are expected to be as smart, if not smarter, than their adult counterparts. And this has got a reason behind it. Humans are evolutionarily coded to understand uh, and analyze complex data and abstract patterns, what we call creativity. But then as this child grows up into an adult and gets all those degrees from the schools and colleges, they tend to lose that raw creativity everyone is born with. And that is because they tend to become biased with their line of thought. Now, teenage is at the crossroads because you are neither too trained to lose that raw creativity you were born with, nor are you not trained enough to carry out scientific investigations. My advice to you is, be of any age. Just go out there and try finding a solution to a problem you care about. It's a wonderful feeling when you know that you can change the world in your own little way. You don't have to be a science prodigy or an extremely smart person to be innovating. Invention just requires you to be yourself. It requires you to be passionate about what you like to do and optimistic about what you can do. Thank you.